I would like to welcome you. Good morning. Good morning here in the room and good morning uh, to all of you who are joining online. It's my pleasure here to welcome you to the uh, joint colloquium, NFDI joint colloquium, uh, physical sciences. Um, it's in particular my pleasure to welcome our guest speaker here today, uh, which is Professor Chris Bauberton. Uh, I would like to start with a few introductory words why we are meeting here together. Uh, and then a few words about the background of uh, Chris Wolferton, and then I uh, would like to hand over to our speaker for today. Um, so uh, this is a, an activity of the NFDI, uh, the National Research Data Infrastructure, which has already a longer history. Uh, so at latest, it started in 2016, uh, where the uh, GVK, the uh, joint um, Association of the, the, the federal uh, uh, character of, of, of Germany, they uh, initiated um, an, uh, an activity that we would need to have a national infrastructure uh, for research data. Uh, and so this uh, has been then heavily funded by uh, the government and the states, uh, uh, and there's a budget for uh, approximately 30 consortia, uh, which are supposed to, to build up this uh, research infrastructure. Uh, and what I like about this kind of concept is that it's really community driven. So uh, the, the uh, activities are distributed in different consortia that every community can build up this research infrastructure in the way it's needed for uh, the specific research direction. Um, and the underlying principle, which of course applies to all of us, is the FAIR principle. Uh, FAIR stands for having data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. That's the underlying idea. And uh, all the consorts that try to interpret this uh, uh, FAIR principle in, in their way. Uh, so there are various consorts uh, established, uh, and uh, you are part, most of you are part of, of uh, consorts which are successfully already running. Um, so these uh, represent uh, different spe specific scientific fields, uh, their methods, uh, and should incorporate uh, the users in a bottom-up approach. Uh, and this is organized then also with uh, uh, consortia assembly, directorate, scientific senate, and, and sections for the interaction between the different consortia. Um, so that's, uh, these are some slides here provided by the DFG. Uh, we need to integrate all these different activities. We, we are aware of the fact that the consorts that come from various, very different fields of, of research, but uh, still required that uh, we have a combination of the activities, uh, that uh, there is no competition between the different uh, consortia, but uh, that they interact, so there needs to be a strong in, in exchange within a consortium with, with the players in the community, but also there needs to be an interaction between different consortia. And the activity we have here is one step in this direction. So we have here this uh, um, combination of activities uh, from the physical sciences. So the different consortia, which are shown here by, by the um, uh, logos at uh, the top of the slide uh, are together uh, here organizing this, this joint colloquium. Uh, and I have also suggested that uh, we have a bit of an exchange besides or after this presentation here in the round table discussion to everybody who would like to join the discussion and bringing the perspectives uh, of the different uh, consortia. So please uh, come at 1.30 to uh, the room uh, in the Iris building that's uh, just uh, 50 meters from here. Uh, and so the idea would be there to, uh, to give a bit of uh, update of the state of the art, what is ongoing in the different NFDI consortia. And in this way also give our speaker a chance to be better understand what we are we doing here in Germany in terms of materials research. And then we are also interested in the perspective uh, from Chris Wolverton, uh, what's going on in US. Uh, but also it gives us a chance to, to uh, uh, get an update what is going on. Um, I would like just to quickly uh, comment on the perspective of the consortium where I am coming from. So um, perhaps I should have introduced myself at the beginning. Uh, my name is Tilman Hickel. You'll find 
my name here at the bottom. Uh, I am uh, from the uh, Federal Institute of Materials Research and Testing, as well as of the Max Planck Institute for Iron Research in Düsseldorf. And I am part of the NFDI Matwerk Consortium, which is one of the NFDI activities. Um, and what perhaps makes our consortium special, or what is the kind of aspect we bring into this kind of set of different uh, FDI consortia in material science, is that uh, we are focusing really on the complexity of the microstructure of materials. Uh, so we are aware of the fact that materials are not only determined by their chemistry, uh, but that the microstructure is essential to understand performance of materials in applications and structural, but also functional applications. Um, and that requires also to handle data, materials data, which are not in thermodynamic equilibrium. And it requires also to take into account that the materials has a, has a certain history uh, uh, from casting onto the application. And so that this kind of evolution of, uh, of the uh, the, uh, the path uh, which a sample experiences on its way and needs to be taken care of and also needs to be represented by the data infrastructure. So that's probably the most important aspect we as NFDI Matwerk uh, here bring into this uh, understanding of materials and uh, structuring materials data. And that means uh, we try to push forward uh, a seamless workflow implementation uh, for connecting all different kinds of scales uh, and different software solutions as well as exper experimental solutions. Um, we believe in local instances uh, for the materials environment so that data remain locally where they have been um, generated. Um, but they still need to be connected. And uh, for our scope of connecting, this is a knowledge graph, a materials knowledge graph, uh, or materials ontology is perhaps a, another term for this, uh, which uh, allows to make all this data, as I mentioned before, findable, accessible, and then also interval and reusable. And this is a community effort. This requires uh, a strong interaction with all uh, scientists who are really working with experimental and simulation data in the fields of materials research. Uh, and that applies to all the NFDI consortia. Uh, and we should also connect this community efforts in activities like uh, the meeting today. And therefore, we have yeah, established this, this joint colloquium. Um, that's not the first one. The first one has already taken place in May. It was organized by Fermat. Um, and uh, there, uh, James Warren has been invited. Uh, that's uh, the director of the NIST Material Genome Program and gave a very nice presentation here. And we had also a nice ex exchange afterwards. Uh, and in this spirit, we have now uh, a second uh, NFDI colloquium. Um, we are again at Humboldt University. So uh, I'm very grateful for, again, a lot of support from, uh, from Fermat uh, to set up uh, this kind of uh, environment here. Uh, both the on-site and online environment uh, has been done by, by Fermat. And so it's very good, uh, very nice that we can count on this experience here. Um, and so this second uh, colloquium is now given by Chris Wolverton with the fancy title, the phase diagram of all inorganic materials. And I'm uh, able to tell you, because I have heard part of the talk before, that this is really a fascinating story. And we are looking forward to this presentation. But before doing this, uh, let me say a few words about Chris. Um, so uh, Chris is a professor, uh, uh, Jerome, Jerome uh, Cohen professor at the Material Science and Engineering Department of Northwestern University. Uh, there's a faculty directory. Um, that's a scientific uh, position, but he is also here because of his activities in data management. And this is in particular uh, the Open Quantum Materials Database, which he has initiated and uh, uh, bringing it forward. And this will be also part of his presentation today. Um, so Chris has uh, studied at the University of Texas uh, and then made his PhD uh, at the UCB at uh, California University of at Berkeley. Um, but uh, then quickly uh, started a more application-driven career, I would say. Um, so he became a resource associate first and then staff scientist as a 
National Renewable Energy Lab, a topic which is uh, very hot also at the moment, but he worked on this, these kind of topics, renewable energy already 30 years ago. Uh, and he has pushed a lot of developments, in particular with Apinicio based uh, research uh, uh, in this field. Uh, he's one of the pioneers to, to uh, really bring new concepts here forward. Uh, and then he has uh, continued this kind of research uh, at Ford Research Laboratory. Uh, he uh, became there a group leader of the hydrogen storage and nanoscale modeling group uh, and uh, has, yeah showed in the industrial environment how uh, working with simulation concepts and particular also up initial based simulation concepts can really help also industrial applications to push them forward. And this, again, I think it's a pioneering work uh, to establish our methods uh, in an industrial environment. And there were a lot of success stories where he really demonstrated that there's an understanding of materials based on, on, on computer simulations. In 2007, he then moved to Northwestern University and uh, uh, has now this um, very uh, distinguished position at Northwestern University. And there are a lot of awards connected to, to Chris Wolferton, um, which I don't want to read uh, out all here. So he uh, has achieved a lot of things within uh, the Ford company. Uh, so for instance, the uh, Ford um, Company Technical Achievement Award uh, and some very various patents. Uh, there's also the American Musicological Society Award, uh, as, uh, something special here on the list. Um, but there are a lot of achievements. I myself, and that's the last slide, met Chris Wolverton for the first time in the year 2006 when we. Uh, started at Max Planck Institute in Düsseldorf to build up a mat computational materials design department. And uh, we have invited the most distinguished people in the field in order to learn from them how uh, computational materials science could be done. And here, the central person of the sticker uh, in 2006 was Chris Wolverton. Uh, and that's the first time uh, when I learned uh, about his activities. Uh, and I was very impressed over it this time. I think this time uh, you were still at Ford, right? Uh, uh, and uh, were really demonstrating all the, in this industrial environment, outstanding materials research. I have listed here uh, a selection of the, uh, the topics Chris has worked on and is continuing to work on. Again, I have no time to go through all of them, but uh, it's an impressive uh, list with very hot topics, particularly related, related to, to hydrogen which is now boosted again, particularly here in Germany. Um, so we are very happy, Chris, that you are here, that you share part of your insights and data management and material science with us. And we are looking forward to your presentation. Well, thank you very much for that very kind uh, introduction. Uh, thanks for everybody for coming. Um, uh, I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit about uh, uh, well, you heard a little bit about the Open Quantum Materials Database. I'll talk a little bit about that. Okay, so sorry for those who are online. I may walk out of the camera uh, viewpoint uh, from time to time, especially when I want to point at the screen because otherwise I'm going to be like turning back and forth a lot. So I'll do my best to stay here, but uh, you might, uh, yeah, move me every now and then. Okay. So I want to I want to start by uh, acknowledging the the folks who collaborated with me and did most of the work. Uh, former group members uh, from my own group, in particular, Vinay Hegda, who's now at Citrine Informatics, and uh, researchers at Toyota Research Institute, uh, most notably uh, Murat Aikal, actually who's moved from Toyota and is now working at uh, Rivion, the electric vehicle company. Okay. So I was going to start out by telling you a little bit about what my group does, but you actually heard a lot about that. So I'm going to skip that slide and go straight to this kind of uh, uh, provocative article uh, from Barron's. Um, this, is a, this is an article from not too long ago, from 2019, a few years ago. And you see the title there of you know, markets that, uh, uh, ideas that could create trillion dollar markets. So it's not so easy to think of something that could create a trillion dollar market. I know all of you are now thinking in your head, what could those things be? Uh, maybe you have some idea when I tell you what they are, you're gonna say, oh yeah, sure, that makes sense. 
So uh, they, they gave, yeah, three technologies. So the first was, actually, does anybody want to guess who hasn't heard me talk about this before? So quantum computing was one. So that makes some sense. Yeah, I see some head nods. Uh, CRISPR gene editing was the second. I would say that also makes some sense. And the third was kind of funny in the article because they don't really know what to call it, but it's, I think in the article, they just call it material science. Uh, but it's pretty clear when you read the article, what they mean is materials discovery and specifically the use of data and AI driven techniques to drive materials discovery in general. So that's kind of interesting, you know, to kind of put, put material, the field of materials informatics in the same category as uh, CRISPR or quantum computing. Um, okay. So, uh, you know, how, how is this going to work? How, how can we use data to actually drive the, uh, and accelerate materials discovery? Um, sorry, I'm going to have to walk over here. <laughs> People on Zoom don't need to see my face, I guess. Um, so, uh, uh, so how are we going to actually use data to, to drive materials discovery? Well, I mean, obviously, the first thing you need is data uh, if you're going to use data-driven methods. And um, I'm going to talk in this talk about the use of computational techniques uh, uh, to, uh, to, to find uh, large quantities of data. Of course, you know, we, could, uh, we could use experimental uh, te uh, techniques to, to get data as well. Um, Okay, but so, you know, if you were going to use a computational technique, I'm going to basically talk almost exclusively in this talk about atomistic scale modeling and density functional theory. Uh, so for those who, uh, who know about DFT, that's the technique I'm going to use. For those who don't know about DFT, it doesn't matter for this talk, actually. It's just a tool that we're going to use to actually uh, get data uh, of properties of materials. Okay, so, so you might think that, well, to start, you just calculate the properties of a bunch of known materials uh, using DFT um, and store that in some kind of database. I'm gonna show you an example of exactly that. Uh, but of course, uh, there's already kind of a disconnect here that if we wanna find new materials I have here in the title, then we can't just calculate properties of known materials, right? We have to also have some mechanism to actually uh, solve for the properties of currently unknown materials to find new ones. Okay. Um, okay, so once we have information in databases like this, I would say there's sort of two main ways that you might think about uh, interrogating that database to find new materials. One is just by sort of simple search, you know, sort of the Google search version of, uh, of searching the database, right? It's just to find new materials by searching for the properties that you're interested in within that data set. Um, that kind of high throughput screening is sort of widely used and very successful for a number of different uh, uh, applications. Um, we might talk about it later on in the roundtable discussion. I'm not going to talk about the screening approach so much today uh, in this talk. Um, but the, the sort of second approach is uh, in cases where uh, you might be searching for uh, materials with some property and perhaps that property is not one of the things that you can easily calculate. So for example, suppose you're searching for the next high temperature superconductor, but superconducting transition temperature is not one of the things that's calculated in your database. So how can you, uh, <clears throat> how can you deal with that problem? Well, this is where uh, machine learning or, or uh, AI driven techniques can come in, right? If we could find correlations between the quantities we can calculate and the things that we're interested in, uh, uh, maybe we can we can uh, find descriptors for these kind of hard to calculate properties. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you a little bit about uh, uh, the Open Quantum Materials Database as a repository for data, uh, and uh, uh, not so much explicitly about machine learning. Again, maybe we'll talk more about that later on, but I, I will mention this uh, in the context of my talk as well. Okay. <clears throat> So like I say, the, the, uh, the database that, that I'm going to use in this talk is the Open Quantum Materials Database. There are other databases of this, of this type uh, uh, around the world. Um, but OQMD is a database that we started at Northwestern about a decade ago. Um, it's a, it's a large-scale database of DFT-calculated properties of materials. Um, it's got a large number of experimentally known compounds in it. So we go to a, a, a data set like the Inorganic Crystal Structure Database, which is a collection of sort of 
all of the inorganic known crystal structures, the ICSD, and we can use those crystal structures as input to DFT calculations to calculate properties. So we've calculated about 50,000 of these sort of experimentally known compounds uh, in the database. But th one of the nice things about DFT is that you're sort of not limited by, you don't have to, to calculate uh, a, a crystal structure that's experimentally observed. You can calculate essentially the properties of any arrangement of atoms uh, that you like. And so in the process of doing a lot of these screening, computational screening things, uh, projects along the, uh, over the last decade or so, we've generated on the order of about a million different, uh, what they call hypothetical, uh, sorry, hypothetical uh, inorganic crystalline compounds. So these are mostly things like decorations of well-known crystal structure types. Like for example, you might imagine the rock salt crystal structure with a single cation and a single anion you can decorate that rock salt crystal structure with sodium and chlorine and form sodium chloride. Uh, but in principle, there's nothing to prevent you from decorating this uh, rock salt crystal structure with any combination of any two elements from the periodic table, right? And do a calculation of that and store it in the database. Okay, so th those are the kinds of things that, that uh, uh, are currently in the, uh, in the OQMD. And like I say, we're about a million compounds uh, in the data set. And so this is a relatively large, uh, sort of relatively well explored uh, data set. It's uh, open online and freely available. That's sort of been our guiding mission uh, from day one actually of creating this database. So you see the very first word that we put in the title was open. Um, and I gotta say, since we started this a decade ago, a decade ago saying that your database was open was not as pervasive as it is today, right? So this seems sort of normal today, but, but in 2013, this wasn't so normal to have this just be freely available. And as a matter of fact, a lot of people asked us, why are you doing that? Like, why don't you keep this for yourself? Um, okay, so there's a lot of things you can do with the database. Uh, what I'm going to talk mostly today about is uh, the, automation, the automated calculation of phase stability. And by that, what I specifically mean is um, convex hull constructions. And I realize that probably most of you are, are quite well aware of what a convex hull is, but maybe there's some in the audience who are not. And uh, if you don't understand a convex hull, you won't understand the rest of the talk. So I really have to stop uh, and explain this just for a couple of minutes. Okay. Uh, oh, sorry. I will in just a minute. I forgot. That's not next. So this is my one slide talking about the computational screening approach. Um, so the idea here in the, the, uh, the idea of uh, finding new materials this way is that, you know, you can imagine now in your database that has large number of candidate uh, compounds, you might start with a very large number of candidate structures. Uh, and then for whatever particular application you have in mind, you could devise a set of computational screens. So for example, for this, for this particular slide, we were interested in strengthening precipitates in a metallic matrix. And we thought, well, what do we want out of those strengthening precipitates? Well, we'd like the, the, the precipitates to be stable or at least nearly stable. They need to form a two-phase equilibrium inside the host. They need to precipitate inside uh, the particular host metal that we're interested in. We might want them to be coherent. So we might want a particular lattice parameter of those, uh, of those precipitates. And then of course, depending on the application, you might be concerned about things like cost and so forth. And the idea is that if you can screen through these attributes, uh, you, know, you, can, you can wind up sort of searching for candidates, uh, hopefully a relatively small number of candidates to satisfy your screens uh, and, and provide promising predictions in this way. So it's a relatively straightforward and simple way uh, to find new materials. But like I say, it's been sort of wildly successful and groups all over the world are doing this for a, a large variety of different applications. Okay, so now I have to, to get back to the convex hull construction. So. Um, you saw, by the way, stability was one of the things that I had on my you know, example screen there. It, stability comes up a lot in a lot of different applications. And so uh, to address stability, we have to, to define something called the convex hull. Okay, so, uh, <clears throat> so what is the convex hull? Well, let, let's start with a very simple example. This is a binary system, just a cartoon illustration of a binary system between two elements, let's call them A and B. And suppose you look in your database for all of the compounds that have those two elements, A and B, only those two elements, right? Uh, so you might you know, search a database and find these four points here. So the, the two pure elements, 
and then two ordered compounds, okay? And typically, what I'm plotting here is the energy on the y-axis as a function, uh, or well, the, the energy on the y-axis and the x-axis is the composition, okay? So uh, composition of pure A is over here and composition of pure B is over here. All right, so typically we, we plot these things as what's called the formation energy. The formation energy is just the energy of the compound relative to the energy of the elements. So the elements have a zero formation energy by, by definition. It's just a, a definition to kind of zero, provide the zero uh, uh, scale. Um, and you see the ordered compounds have a negative formation energy, meaning they're more stable than the combination of the elements. Okay, so that's good for stability, right? That our compounds are more stable than the elements, but it's not sufficient. Right? So it's sort of necessary that the formation energy be negative, but it's not sufficient. What is sufficient for thermodynamic stability is that the compounds have to be lower in energy, not just in the elements, but they have to be lower in energy than anything else, meaning any other linear combination of phases, okay? Any other phase or combination of phases. All right, so if I drew these four data points here, uh, and I said, well, at any composition, what's the lowest energy linear combination of those four data points? I think you could probably pretty easily just draw that answer by hand or by eye. Um, it would be this sort of piecewise linear uh, uh, connection of the points here, right? So uh, this, this is known as the convex hole, and it, it basically just tells you what the lowest energy linear combination of, uh, of phases is at any composition. Okay, so now the key things about the convex hull that are necessary to understand the rest of the talk are uh, compounds that are on the convex hull, like this, are thermodynamically stable, uh, meaning that there's no lower energy uh, combination or decomposition of compounds uh, that can occur. Um, and maybe more importantly is the, the lines connecting points are tie lines uh, uh, indicating a stable two-phase equilibrium. So for example, this compound AB can be in equilibrium with A. If you formed a mixture of AB and A, they would form a stable two-phase mixture, right? Because they have a tie line. On the other hand, this compound AB3, if you formed a mixture of it with A, they're both stable uh, by themselves, but if you mix them together, they don't share a tie line, so they would not be stable. They would react and in fact form this compound, right? So if you drew a line between these two, you could see you could lower the energy of that line by creating this. Okay, so far so good, all right. All right, so now you know all you need to know about convex holes to understand the rest of the talk. Um, the other thing is that you can see very easily that this provides you a mechanism for finding new materials or new stable materials. So if you, for example, thought that there might be a new stable material over at this composition, you could say, great, this is the currently known formation energy, the lowest energy uh, that we have currently. And if you calculate some new structure that you're adding to the database and you find that it's up here, well, it's a negative formation energy, but sorry, it's not on the convex hull, so it's not stable. On the other hand, if you find something that's down here, uh, which actually disappeared from the slide, um, if, if there was something down here that would actually be stable. And in fact, if you added that, now the convex hull would change. You'd have to redraw the convex hull. It would start from here, go down here, go down here, now down to your new phase and then back up. Okay, great. All right, so um, the nice thing about these kind of uh, large scale databases like OQMD is that it's pretty easy to calculate convex holes for a given collection of, uh, of points. So we have a million points in the, in the database and you can calculate uh, convex holes quite, quite easily and quite uh, systematically this way for essentially an arbitrary number of components. So not just for binary systems, but for ternary and quaternary and so forth. So for example, for a binary system, you might see a, a convex hole that looks something like this. This is the iron silicon convex hole. Um, and you see you know, something that looks very much like the cartoon I just showed you of the, the stable compounds, the stable iron silicides that are in this system. You see, by the way, some other points here that are above the convex hole. These are other, just other data points that happen to be in the database for whatever reason. Okay, so you see, and uh, yeah, so you see basically what's stable, you see what's not stable, and you see the tie lines connecting which phases actually have stable two phase equilibrium. That's the key thing that you, the key information you get out of the convex hull. Now, what about a ternary system? Well, sorry, by the way. So in a, in a binary system, there's uh, only one composition, right? I only, if, if I have an iron silicon system, I only have to specify 
the composition of iron or silicon. And the other one is just uh, dictated by uh, conservation of matter, right? So I only have one composition for a binary system. If I go to a ternary system, now I'm gonna go to two independent compositions, right? So the, the dimensionality of the convex hull is gonna grow by one. It's gonna become a three-dimensional, this is a two-dimensional object for a binary system. In a ternary, it's gonna become a three-dimensional object. And three-dimensional objects are not so easy to show, especially on a PowerPoint presentation. So typically we just project out the energy axis and show this as a Gibbs triangle. Okay, so if for this example, the lithium iron oxygen system, this is the Gibbs triangle between lithium at this corner, iron up here and oxygen here. Again, you see now the, the stable phases that exist in the convex hull. You see tie lines that are connected between the, the stable phases. And now in a ternary system, actually there's more information than that. You actually see uh, stable three phase equilibria as well, right? That you see uh, triangles in the, in the uh, convex hull and those triangles indicate stable three phase equilibria between the phases that are at the vertices of the triangle. Okay. So in general, there's a, a couple of things that are important here. As we increase the number of components, the dimensionality of the convex hull grow, goes up. And two, as we increase the number of components, which we know by the Gibbs phase rule, the number of uh, phases that can be in equilibrium also goes up. Okay. So what happens if you ask for a five component phase diagram? Well, now the, the convex hull is five dimensional. And I don't have any hope of showing it to you in any sort of sensible way. So uh, what you get in return is just a graph uh, representation of the convex hull. Okay, so for this five component system, you see the compounds that are on the convex hull, you see the tie lines indicating two phase equilibria that connect convex, uh, compounds of the convex hull, but, uh, but, the, uh, but the location of the points now doesn't really mean anything. Okay. All right, so um, I think in the interest of time, I was gonna show you one quick example and I'm gonna skip that and go straight to this uh, uh, network theory idea. Okay, so I, I wanna use this convex hull construction uh, and uh, I wanna use it in a particular context. Uh, the context is uh, the use of um, network theory to understand complex networks. So, um, you know, complex networks exist in a large number of different areas. Uh, you know, the internet itself is a, obviously a very complex uh, interconnected network. Um, uh, you know, how electrical power is connected in a city uh, is a very, uh, very complex network. These kind of uh, complex networks are, you know, are everywhere, pervasive. Uh, and network theorists are doing very interesting work in analyzing their behavior and analyzing the topology of these networks uh, and understanding how they scale with size. This can, this can uh, provide you for predictions of how these kind of networks will scale with size and, and uh, you can learn sort of all sorts of interesting things from them. Um, but what about material science? What about the field of materials? What about the application of network theory to these uh, issues? I think, I think the, the idea of network theory is sort of far less pervasive in material science and maybe in part because um, of the material science paradigm, right? We're taught uh, as students that uh, the, the processing of a material affects its structure. We actually just saw that in Tillman's talk uh, very explicitly pointed out. Uh, uh, that the processing affects structure and that the structure affects properties, right? So this is a very kind of bottom up way of looking at a problem. It's certainly, a, you know, the correct way in some ways to look at it and very, very powerful. Um, but I think with these kind of large scale databases that kind of survey all of material space uh, at one time, we have the possibility now to take kind of a more top down view and see what we can actually learn from a network uh, perspective. Okay. All right. So if we want to if we want to uh, apply network theory tools to material science, the first thing we have to do is construct a network. Uh, and so the question is, how do we do that? How do we link together materials to form a network uh, that we can analyze in some way? Well, you probably already know the answer to this, or what I'm going to say is the answer to this, but based on what I've talked about already, and that is it's the convex hull, right? The convex hull already, I've told you, is tells you uh, compounds that are stable and tells you compounds that are sort of linked together to form stable two-phase equilibrium. So this already starts to feel like a network. Um, 
And certainly for, for uh, material science students who are sort of taught about phase diagrams and phase stability, uh, this, this makes a lot of sense too, right? So uh, here's, a, here's a typical phase diagram, uh, a nickel aluminum phase diagram. Um, and if you think about that, you know, the, the composition axis is here and temperature is here. What is the phase diagram? Well, it's just a, it's just a map of which phases are stable for a given composition and a given temperature. And since this is a binary system, there's essentially two possibilities, right? You can either have a stable phase, a single phase, or you can have a stable two-phase mixture, right? Those are essentially the only two possibilities here. Well, except at points, I guess you can have three-phase equilibrium, but okay. So basically then the, the, the phase diagram is divided into these blue regions, which are stable single phases, and the white regions, which are sta uh, stable two-phase equilibria. Right, so you see the phases that are stable here, the liquid phase here is solid nickel solid solution here, an intermetallic nickel aluminum here and so forth. And then you see the, the white regions indicate which phases can form stable equi equilibria with others. So for example, this nickel rich solid solution exists and the intermetallic exists, but there's no two phase region connecting those two phases. In other words, they don't form a stable two phase equilibria. They would react to form something else if you brought them together. As a matter of fact, they would form this phase that is in the middle. Okay. All right, the ternary phase diagram uh, is kind of a similar idea, right? A ternary nickel aluminum titanium phase diagram has stable single phases. Uh, white regions that are two-phase equilibria. And now there's these triangles that exist in this phase diagram that indicate the three-phase equilibria uh, that are stable uh, as well, okay? All right, so this really starts to seem like a, a kind of a network construction of phases that are linked together topologically in these phase diagrams. I'm gonna, I'm gonna sort of go from these composition temperature dependent phase diagrams to the very simplistic version of this, which is the, the T equals zero isothermal section. So at T equals zero, these, con these phase diagrams just become the convex holes, okay? Um, and so again, we can sort of, uh, you know, say that the convex holes basically tell us what phases are stable and the, the, uh, uh, the phases are linked together by tie lines indicating two-phase equilibria. And this is what I'm going to define as my network, okay? So I think, yeah, it's, it's down here at the bottom of the screen, which is a little bit hard to, to see, but I'm just going to define as a network. Nodes of the network are going to be stable phases on the convex hull, and edges of the network are going to be tie lines connecting stable phases, right? This is, this is going to be my network construction. Okay, so we can use, uh, we can, we can, uh, basically turn these convex holes into graph representations, right? So basically just emphasizing the connectivity uh, of the graph and you can start to see things like, well, maybe we'll, we'll uh, make a graph representation where the size of the node indicates how many tie lines come out of that node, right? So in this particular, this simple uh, binary system, we have compounds that have two tie lines coming out like this one, but we also have uh, elements like this one that only have one tie line coming out. So those would be a different size. And you can extend this idea to ternary, you know, mapping the ternary convex hull onto a graph and the quaternary and so forth and keep going. This is a, I think a, a 10 or an 11 component uh, system. Uh, and you start to see that the graph becomes very complex, of course, uh, but the idea is still the same. The nodes are just stable phases. The size of the nodes indicates how many tie lines are coming out of each node. Uh, and the, the connectivity is indicated by tie lines. All right, so there's a couple of things that I said here now, and if we take them together, those, those uh, uh, form kind of a very provocative idea. The two things are that the n-component system has a convex hull that's n-dimensional. So I said, right, the binary had a two-dimensional convex hull, the ternary had a three-dimensional convex hull. So the n-component system had an n-dimensional convex hull. Secondly, I said kind of cavalierly that we could compute the convex hull for arbitrary n. Okay, so if you push me on that, I'm gonna have to explain what I mean by that, but I'm gonna skip right over that and just say, yeah, sure, this is true. Um, so if, if we can compute the convex hull for arbitrary n, what if we just allow n to grow to its maximum possible value? What's the maximum possible, possible value of the number of components can be? Well, it's the number of elements in the periodic table. If we could somehow uh, you know, let n grow to the number of elements in the periodic table. Uh, let's say there's a hundred, roughly a hundred elements. 
and, and we could actually compute the convex hull for this 100 uh, component system, this would essentially be a phase diagram of everything, right? This would be, uh, well, there would just be one of these convex hulls and any convex hull that I've ever shown you or that you've ever seen, any phase diagram you've ever seen is just a, a section of this, uh, this phase diagram of everything. Okay, so this, this, uh, this object would be, uh, if, it, if we were gonna consider a 100 component system, it would be a 100 dimensional object, right? So the convex hull would be 100 dimensional. Um, and like I say, this is, this is what we're gonna do. This is what we're gonna calculate. It's gonna define uh, the network here. Uh, the problem is of course, that if we calculate this 100 dimensional convex hull, I really have no way to show it to you, right? I can't even, I can't even show you this. Right, because that it would just look like a complete mess, to be honest. Okay, all right. So, so what do I do at this point? Well, at this point, I just tell you that we did do the calculation. We basically just calculated the convex hull of the entirety of the OQMD in this 100-dimensional space, and now I'm just going to not be able to show it to you. I, we analyze the topology of this network, and I'm just going to tell you about the topology. You're just gonna to have to sort of believe me that, that uh, we did the convex hull construction because I have no other way to show it to you. All right, so what do we learn about this, uh, this convex hull of everything that we computed? Well, um, first of all, I should, I should probably point out that uh, databases like the OQMD are always evolving in time, right? We're always adding new compounds to the database. So any kind of uh, analysis that we do like this is just a snapshot of when we happen to have calculated. Okay, so I'm just telling you that because in fact, the numbers are already out of date and you know, uh, the numbers are already different than, uh, than what they were when we calculated this. But when we calculated this, uh, we found that there were 21,000 stable inorganic solids. In other words, on the, uh, of our 1 million compounds in the OQMD, only 21,000 actually appear on the convex hull. The rest do not, okay? Um, all right, so 21,000 nodes in our network, how many edges, how many stable tie lines? Well, about 40 million. So 40 million combinations of materials that can form stable two-phase equilibria. All right, so probably you're not, uh, many of you are not quick enough to actually do 21 choose two in your head to see like, wait, what's the total number of possible uh, combinations? Well, I'll do the math for you to tell you that uh, every material in the network has a tie line with about 20% of all other materials. In other words, if you pick an inorganic compound at random and you ask, what's the likelihood it forms stable uh, two-phase equilibrium with another compound I chose at random, you have about a 20% chance to find that stable equilibrium. In 80% of the cases, you'll find those two compounds will react to form something else. Okay, this is an extremely highly connected network compared to what other network theorists tend to study, like social networks. Uh, I oftentimes say, you know, saying that, that every material has a tie line with 20% of all other materials, if you were analyzing sort of Facebook as a network, this would be analogous to saying that every human being on Facebook is friends with 20% of all humans on Earth, right? Which obviously is not true. Okay. Okay, so. So very highly connected. We can already see that this materials network is gonna be quite different from, from other networks that people study. Uh, the mean node degrees, sorry, the node degree is just the number of tie lines coming out of uh, a given node. Okay, so the number of edges coming out of a node. Um, so the, uh, on average, this is about 3,800. So this means that on average, any compound in the network has a tie line with about 3,800 other compounds. Um, okay, what else can we do? So we can start to analyze all other sorts of kind of uh, topological features of this network, like the network diameter. So the network diameter is sort of analogous to the six degrees of separation, which people uh, you surely have heard about that all humans are sort of related to, any human can be connected to any other human by six degrees of uh, friendships. Okay, so the, the network size or the, the diameter of human interactions then is six uh, in this. Uh, so our network diameter for the materials network is very small, 1.8. Okay, and why is it so small? Well, it's so small because there's a lot of hubs in this network. There are a lot of materials in this network that essentially have tie lines with everything, 
for example, the noble gases, right? The noble gases are essentially completely stable and inert and don't react with anything to form new compounds. What this means in terms of the network is that they have a tie line with everything in the network, right? The, the, the noble gases essentially have a, a tie line with everything. And if you were interested in going from compound one to compound two, you know there's always a path from compound one to any noble gas and then the noble gas to compound two. Right? There's always that path. So that would be a network diameter of two. And we know that 20% of all materials are actually linked directly. So the network is actually smaller than two. It's actually 1.8. Okay, what else can we learn? We can learn other, other topological features like the clustering coefficient. The clustering coefficient just tells you something about if, uh, if compound one is linked to compound two and compound three via a tie line, What's the probability that two and three also share a tie line themselves? Okay, so this is called the clustering coefficient and the clustering coefficient of our network is about 0.5, which is a, a, again, a very, very dense, uh, uh, highly interconnected network. Okay, so what are some of the other things that we can learn by uh, looking at this? Well, like I say, we can learn things about sort of the scaling behavior of this network. If we plot the, the number of nodes in our network uh, uh, versus the node degree, again, the node degree, again, is the number of tie lines coming out of each node. We see this kind of uh, uh, distribution that looks like a, a, a log normal distribution um, that does have a heavy tail here. So we have you know, this small number of nodes that actually have a very high node degree. These are the hubs that I talked about, right? The, the materials that actually have a, an enormous number of tie lines in the network, okay? So there are definitely these, uh, these uh, materials that act as hubs in the network. Um, this kind of behavior, by the way, is again, sort of different from the common sort of social networks that many network theorists analyze. Um, what else? We can look at things like this. This is a, a plot of, um, the, the mean clustering coefficient uh, uh, as a function of the node degree. And you see up here that there are some materials that actually have a very high clustering coefficient, but a very small uh, node degree. So this means a, a small number of tie lines, but within these communities, uh, there's high degree of interconnectedness. So these are like sort of communities of compounds that actually exist you know, not exactly in isolation, but they're very well connected within the community, but they're only sort of weakly connected to the rest of the network, okay? So this is kind of interesting uh, behavior as well. And then finally, one, one final thing that I'll point out here is you can plot the, the mean neighbor degree uh, versus the node degree. So again, the node degree is the number of tie lines coming out of each compound. You might ask, well, what, what is the node degree of the things it's connected to? Is it does you know does a compound uh, a compound that is itself highly connected does it connect to things that are themselves highly connected or things that are sort of uh, have a smaller node degree and in fact it turns out to, they tend to be connected to things that have a smaller node degree so this kind of behavior I know you, it's hard to see at the bottom of the slide is called dissociative uh, behavior and uh, this network is sort of weakly dissociative in that sense okay. So what can we learn from, from looking at a network like this? Well, there's a couple of things I wanna try and point out here that we, we learn. One is uh, uh, something that we extracted from this network called the nobility index. I've already kind of hinted many times at the idea that uh, the existence of a tie line indicates in some sense stability with another compound and the absence of a tie line indicates reactivity, right? That those compounds would react to form something else. So it seems somehow intuitively like the number of tie lines coming out of a compound indicates something about its stability or, or its lack of reactivity, I guess I would say. Okay, so we made the index of what we call the nobility index. It's just a z-score of the number of tie lines. A z-score uh, is just basically the, the mean minus the, uh, uh, sorry, the, the number uh, of tie lines, in this case, the log of the number of tie lines minus the average divided by the standard deviation. So a z-score that's positive means that that uh, material has more tie lines than, than uh, the average. And a z-score that's negative means it has less tie lines uh, than average. And a z-score of plus one means it has more tie lines than average, exactly one standard deviation more than the mean. 
Okay, so this is kind of interesting and simple, right? Just a very simple measure of the number of tie lines coming out of each compound in the network. But it's, it's kind of interesting because it's a, a score of reactivity. It's purely data driven, right? There's no intuition involved in defining this. And that's in contrast to, you know, what, what uh, people have tried to do, you know, for hundreds of years in defining nobility or reactivity of uh, certain elements or certain compounds almost always these kind of scales of reactivity or nobility are defined with some bias or some intuition in mind, right? You almost always think of some certain specific types of reactions when you're defining uh, uh, reactivity, but this is a, just a purely data-driven uh, metric that includes sort of all possible types of reactions. So that's kind of interesting. So let's see how this nobility index looks if we just look at it for the elements. So again, I just want to emphasize, you can define this now for anything in the network, compounds and other things, but I'm just showing you for the elements uh, what this is. So again, a positive score means uh, noble, a negative score means reactive. Uh, and so what do you see when you look across the periodic table? Well, you see some things I think that make a lot of sense. You see the the noble gases actually have a, a very high positive uh, score. They are the most noble. Uh, so that makes a lot of sense, of course. Um, you see the noble metals, copper, silver, gold, actually do have high positive scores, right? So that also makes some sense. Uh, maybe some people think that gold is the most noble metal uh, from, a, from a catalytic point of view, but in terms of this metric, actually silver actually has a, a larger number of tie lines than, than gold. So slightly more noble based on this metric. Uh, what else makes sense? Well, fluorine having a very, very strongly negative value, meaning it's the most reactive, it's actually the most reactive element in the periodic table, according to this metric. So that also makes some sense, but there are definitely things that maybe don't, uh, you know, maybe don't jive with intuition, like the alkali, uh, uh, alkali metals and alkaline earth. So alkali metals, I think we all kind of intuitively think of as being very reactive. So you would think that they would have a very strong negative score, but in fact, they have a positive score. Meaning, in other words, they have more tie lines than you might think. And probably our intuition about the reactivity of alkali metals is sort of, we're really thinking about how they react in a certain way, like with water or with oxygen, things like that. But you know, this metric considers every possible type of reaction. Okay, so um, in the final however many minutes, 10 minutes, okay, in the final 10 minutes, I want to tell you one more example uh, about uh, how we can use this network and how we can use it to define uh, what I'm going to call synthesizability of compounds. So the literature now, I, I've, I've said a couple of times that, you know, many groups around the world are, um, are using computational screening. Uh, uh, to find new materials with exciting properties. Um, there's sort of papers being published, you know, uh, regularly with newly predicted compounds that have, uh, uh, you know, that are computationally predicted and they have exciting properties, right? So th there's all sorts of uh, papers out there. Uh, my students made this slide and I have to say they sort of biased this slide towards my own group, but there's, you know, many, many more, uh, many, many more papers than this out there. Okay, so the literature is sort of being becoming full of these predictions. And, you know, if you if you then take these predictions to your experimental colleagues and say, hey, I've got this fantastic solar material you should really try out, probably the first thing they would say is, well, either no, or, uh, or how do you synthesize that, right? And, and I would say this is usually where, at least in my group, we fall, uh, we fall down and basically say, well, I don't know, good luck. <laughs> um, so, you know, in, in some ways, this, this uh, issue of synthesis is really becoming a bottleneck in the pipeline of computational predictions. So we're able to make these predictions much, much faster uh, then we can predict how or whether these materials will even be synthesized. So this, this issue of predicting synthesis is an enormous challenge. Um, it's not really well served by me trying to talk about it in you know, one minute at the last uh, bit of my talk, but just to say that this is a huge challenge. There's a lot of different uh, sort of expert driven techniques that people are using to try and uh, determine sort of 
thermodynamic conditions under which uh, under which compounds will be stable and hence synthesizable, which thermodynamic variables uh, uh, will will tend to stabilize them. There's the natural language processing uh, of the literature to try and sort of text mine synthesis recipes from the literature, all sorts of very interesting things going on. But it's, you know, this is still an enormous challenge and, and in some ways a really enormous challenge because it's not just a function of thermodynamics and kinetics. It's, I mean, that would be hard enough, but it's, it's an even bigger problem than that. Whether or not a given compound can be synthesized or has been synthesized or not is a function of a lot of other kind of non-scientific factors, I would say, like, you know, does a particular laboratory have the right tools or the right precursors in their lab to make a given material? Is there funding in that area to, you know, are, are people funding that particular part of chemical space for people to look for new materials or not? You know, the, all of those kind of things will affect whether or not a compound has been synthesized or not, right? And obviously it's, you know, kind of a daunting task to try and think about how you could possibly predict something like that. Okay. So what I'm going to do is, is take a step back and say, well, I'm not going to try and predict the synthesis recipe. I'm going to admit that's too hard for me. Um, but I'm going to say, rather than trying to synthesis, uh, predict the synthesis pathway, maybe we could just predict the likelihood of synthesis. In other words, maybe we could tell our experimental colleagues, here's a compound, and I think it's very likely you can synthesize this, even if I can't tell you how. Okay. Uh, so this would be something, and and what I want to do is uh, use the this network idea uh, to as a backdrop for that. Okay, so how are we going to do this? Um, well, the idea is that many of the compounds in our network, right, that the stable compounds in this network come from these experimental databases of crystal structures like ICSD, right? So any compound that's been experimentally synthesized and is in the network it has a timestamp associated with it, right? We know what year that compound was first experimentally discovered. So this means that if we, just for the moment, if we just think about restricting the network to only compounds that have been experimentally synthesized, it means every node in the network has a timestamp and means now we can sort of rewind time and we can ask which of these materials existed in 1960 or in 1970 or 1980. We can ask what was the convex hole then? Right? So we can actually plot then the number of stable compounds as a function of the year of their discovery. You see on this uh, logarithmic plot, the, the number of compounds is growing exponentially, right? And, but we can also look at the number of tie lines uh, and see how that's, uh, that's increasing. Actually, the, interestingly, the number of tie lines is growing slightly faster than the number of uh, compounds, meaning the network is becoming even more connected. Okay, so what does this mean? It means that we can sort of follow the evolution of this network as a function of time. And maybe if we analyze that, there's some clue in how the network evolves over time that would give us a hint that some new compound was about to appear. Right? If we look for examples of you know, when a compound first appeared in the network, and then we look slightly before that and say, was there any hint that something was about to appear here? Okay, so this is exactly the kind of thing that's too difficult for us to do as humans, but it's very easy for machine, well, not easy, but uh, ma machine learning is well suited for this problem. Okay, so the idea then is, uh, let's create a, a machine learning model of what I'm gonna call the discovery timeline for a given material I. So the discovery timeline is a very simple sort of sequence of zeros and ones as a function of uh, time T, the discovery timeline is zero until the year of the discovery of that compound, and then it's one uh, uh, for every time after that. So the question is, could we machine learn this property, this discovery timeline? Uh, in other words, uh, you know, essentially be able to predict the year uh, of, uh, of discovery of a given compound I. So, we made a machine learning model. Uh, I, I don't have time to sort of take you through the details of that, but I'm just gonna tell you that the representation that we used to build that machine learning model were all of these topological features of the network that I talked about, the node degree and the clustering coefficient and all of these things that we can define for everything in the network. We use those as features in our machine learning model uh, and, try and uh, uh, try and learn this discovery timeline property, okay? So the, the um, you know, sort of a relatively simple random forest works pretty well in this regard. 
Uh, it actually uh, achieves you know, decent accuracy. And what it does is now this machine learned model provides us kind of essentially a prediction of at any given time, like say today, what is the probability that the model thinks that a given compound should have been synthesized? Okay, so what it means is that we can actually go back to the literature now and look at these papers where materials were computationally predicted and we can actually run them through this machine learning model and, and uh, assess the probability that the machine learning model thinks that uh, these, these uh, materials are likely to have been synthesized. So we can you know, uh, look and, and you know, sort them based on you know, some, some materials where the machine learning model is sort of very, very confident that that, that, uh, that particular compound should have been synthesized already some you know, sort of uh, much less so. And now at least we can sort of rank order these things. So when we take our predictions to our experimental colleagues, if you know, they're only able to, you know, to attempt synthesis of five or 10 compounds, we can say these are the five or 10 that we think are probably going to be likely to be synthesized. Still can't tell you how to do it, which is admittedly a pretty big deficiency, uh, but at least this is, this is uh, pointing in the right direction. Um, Okay, so I think I'm just about out of time. The last thing I want to say is that uh, this, this last work, the synthesizability work was done in collaboration with colleagues at uh, the Toyota Research Institute uh, in California. And, uh, you know, somewhat unusual, I guess I can say as a former industry person myself, is that they really wanted to put all this online, uh, which I still don't quite understand, but I'm very happy about. Um, and so they, they uh, put all of this uh, network discovery stuff online here. You can see the website and you can basically uh, spend lots of time sort of exploring these networks. You can see in very small type there, the synthesis probability is sort of one of the features that you can look at. Uh, and in this particular case, this was a kind of an interesting sort of validation study, the lithium osmium oxide perovskite. Uh, it's a well-known you know, well compound now. Uh, but at the time that we actually downloaded the ICSD and formed the materials network, this compound had not yet been discovered. So it was not, you know, it was not in our uh, uh, in our uh, network. It was a, a prediction, and the you know the prediction probability of synthesis was nearly 100%, which is good because it has been synthesized. Okay, so I'd encourage you to go there and uh, and take a look at that. Um, so just in, in conclusion, then, I tried to tell you a little bit about sort of data-driven methods, uh, this idea of uh, forming a materials network from the convex hull of sort of the entirety of these large-scale databases, uh, and two ways that we sort of extracted information, this nobility index, and then a, a machine learning model of the synthesizability. Um, and then just in close, I want to say that all of this this whole idea of network, uh, this network that I talked about, all relied on forming the network from the convex hull. I'm sure that that's only one way to make a network out of uh, materials, and I'm sure that there are other ways. Uh, and this kind of network theory uh, approach, I hope, can uh, uh, can provide new evidence or new avenues to sort of look at large-scale database like this. So, with that, I will stop and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, Chris, thanks a lot. This uh, was a fantastic journey. Uh, when I saw for the first time the title of the face icon of everything, <laughs> I was uh, thinking that that's a kind of crazy idea, but uh, it's really impressive what you made out of it. Of course, there are still a lot of uh, shortcomings. Yeah, that's not that the, the perfect uh, materials graph as you also indicated it. There may be other approaches, but we have, one has to start. One has to work with the data we have available and uh, has to build up networks or infrastructure which allows you to do such kind of research. And that's why it's such a nice example and it's very, very good that you have shared this with us. Thanks a lot. I would like now to open a discussion. Um, for technical reasons, uh, the suggestion was to first start with the people sitting here in the room. Uh, and then we uh, later uh, hand over also to questions which might come from the online audience. Uh, and then we can also come back to the room here. So yeah.
the presentation is open for discussion and yeah, there's the first question there. Can you use the microphone that is there? Is this switched on? Does this work? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Chris. It was really a great presentation. I enjoyed it again <laughs> very much. <laughs> I have a question that actually is a little bit out of the box or uh, broader. So it seems that you can do everything, right? You can predict any material, you can grow any material. However, I, we had an industry meeting recently from our uh, Nomad Center of Excellence, and then I asked a representative, so what about dependencies and uh, how do we make sure that we can grow the material or have the material that we want to have, right? And then he said, well, industry, the least thing industry is interested in is in new materials because they have to change everything. So we love to talk about materials design, but how realistic is it that these materials will ever be used or, or are wanted by industry? <laughs> well, right. I mean, so, so I came from forward from the automotive industry. I would say if there was any risk averse industry, it's hard to think of anything more than automotive. Uh, you know, so, so, you know, basically I, I worked with a group of physical metallurgists there, worked on cast aluminum engine blocks. They were interested in, you know, sort of optimizing uh, these, uh, these engine block alloys and such. But just like you say, the one constraint was you can't change the alloy, right? They were, you know, sort of insistent that, that that could not be changed. So in other words, the only thing you could change was the powertrain design, the processing conditions and all of these. So, um, yeah, this is a this is a completely different uh, uh, problem and way of looking at it, sort of trying to, for a given material, understand sort of the processing. Well, the processing structure property relations. Okay, thank you. But it's obvious that we need new materials, right? And we need meta materials. The question is, how fast can we bring it into the process of being used? No. Yeah, I think. Well, I mean, I don't know what what Jim Warren talked about a few months ago, but I mean, this is kind of a fundamental part of the Materials Genome Initiative, right? It's, you know, really the the what what the Materials Genome wants to do is to accelerate the insertion of new materials into, you know, into products, right? And you know the discovery of a of a material is only one part, and maybe even a minor part uh, of that. You know, a very large difficulty comes between the discovery of the material and its development into you know into real applications. That accelerating that de development timeline is hugely important, but definitely not what I was talking about today. Yeah, I think this is actually our point. We we talk much more about the discovery, how to speed up discovery, but so far I think there's not so much effort, uh, at least from the science community, to bring it into into application. Yeah, so, right. I, anyway, thank you. I don't well, want to take Well, maybe I could just say one more thing, because you and I were just talking before this about science versus engineering in material science right. and engineering. Um, you know, oftentimes I sort of see that division in this context as well, that the scientists are definitely more sort of interested in discovery sure. and the engineers are definitely more interested in development. Yeah. Um, yeah, but we need both, I think. Thank you. Yeah. Is there another question here in the room? Yes, please. Yeah, please use the microphone. Um, hello, thank you very much. This was very exciting. I actually took some notes. Um, uh, the um, OQMD, uh, like its naming place, is, is, is open, obviously, um, but it gets fed quite a lot from the ICSD, which is not. Um, I'm just wondering if there are like any data implications about this. Um, as a material scientist, it annoys me very much that the ICSD is not open and you can just not freely use it. Right, right. Um... Okay, I'll tell you a short story. I, I'll try not to make this a long story. So when we, you know, when we started uh, OQMD, uh, you know, we wanted we wanted to get sort of the entirety of the ICSD. You know, we at Northwestern had access to it, we had licensed it, but still the web interface only would provide you, you know, 100 compounds at a time or something like this. We really needed the entirety of the thing, and so my students came to me and said, "Well, we have essentially two options here." Option one is that we can ask for permission. You know, we can contact the ICSD and say, hey, we licensed it. Can we just download the whole thing or can you give us the whole thing? Option two was hack the CD. Is this being recorded? <laughs> okay, no, but I can tell this story because we chose option one, 
<laughs> right. So, so we contacted them, you know, again in 2013, I think that they didn't quite understand like, what are you doing? You know, what, you know, why would anyone care about a DFT database of these things? And, um, and so, yeah, they, what they were mostly concerned about was they said, if you take a, a given crystal structure from ICSD, you relax it within DFT, then it's fine if you publish the DFT relaxed coordinates. You just can't publish the experimental coordinates. Now, those of us who do DFT might say that's kind of strange because they're not going to be that different. But okay, that's that's what they were sort of interested in protecting is the original data. And so the OKMB is sort of set up so that you can see all of the output from the DFT, but you can't see the input from the ICSD. Yeah, but you can see if there is a label that it comes originally from the ICSD. This is how you calculate Correct. likelihood of Correct. synthesis. And yeah, 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 so. right. Absolutely. So as a, as a matter of fact, kind of a pro tip for if you're using the OQMD and you search for a whole bunch of different materials, you can look at the reference. The last column will be the reference where the crystal structure comes from. If the reference exists, then that compound is almost always from the ICSD. And that's the reference given. If the reference is blank, then usually this is a computationally predicted compound. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Sure. Speaking about databases, how do you have involved? Uh, when, when one thinks about phase diagrams, one thinks about CALFAT. Again, uh, not open, but is there any connection to, to CALFAT approaches here? Also? Well, for sure, there's a lot of connection, right? I mean, people are using DFT a lot to supplement. I mean, so CALFAT for maybe if people in the audience don't know what that is, stands for calculation of phase diagrams. And it's a, it's a technique whereby if you basically have the Gibbs free energy of every possible compound you think you might be interested in, you can sort of couple that with a giant minimizer to do common tangent construction and compute phase diagrams. So CalFAD, uh, CalFAD predictions are very powerful. You can do sort of multi-component uh, phase diagrams. So people in industry use CalFAD all the time. Um, but they're reliant on these databases. I started that by saying, if you knew the free energy of every phase, right? So usually these things are, are uh, taken from a combination of literature and established phase diagrams. But now and now more and more DFT is used not to provide all of the data that goes into CalFed, but the missing data, I would say. You know, so uh, these kind of T equals zero energies are pretty easy to get from DFT, pretty hard to get from experiment. So that's kind of a good marriage. Whereas the stuff that's hard to get from DFT usually are sort of easier to achieve from experiment. So you can, you can get these things together. But, but one thing I should point out, of course, is that um, you know, to compute a real phase diagram at temperature, like in CalFAD, um, you can't you know, just approximate away everything as T equals zero stoichiometric ordered compounds like I have done here, right? So solid solutions exist in every phase diagram. And, and CalFAD constructions have that solid solution behavior built in. So, yeah, so there's a lot of linkages, but I think that there's a lot more that could come and if we could sort of build in solid solution behavior into these DFT databases. I think CalFAD has even problems to get to T equals zero no? and to uh, look into. Right. Uh, yeah, right. But I was wondering if the, the TDB files, which are used for CalFAD or used for ThermoCalc, uh, can you can read in TDB files uh, evaluated also for, for your um, Matthias graphs, um, because uh, it tells you which kind of connections uh, between different phases are already described in CalFAD. No? Right, right. So, so I'm trying to understand, are you asking whether we can make a TDB file out of our well, graph? The other way around, or, can, can you read in information which are available right. via the TDB files? Well, okay, so the answer is no in either case, but... Um, yeah. But yeah, that's an interesting idea. I, so again, I would think that the, the interconnectedness, well, okay, the other thing I should point out about CalFAD is that usually the databases that CalFAD practitioners sell are sort of specific to a specific type of material, right? So you'll have a, a iron and steel database and you have an aluminum alloy database and a magnesium alloy database and high entropy alloy database. I don't think that CalFAD has like a database of everything. Um, and, and but still in a subset that might, might be useful to look into connectivity. Right, right, right yeah. for sure, for sure. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. Carsten, you had a question as well? I was actually currently wondering if there are questions from the online audience. Lucia, so shall we switch to online questions? Uh, 
So, hi, hi, Chris. Uh, I, I'm Chris Evo. <laughs> hi, Chris. Uh, thank you very much for the for the great talk. Um, I have one question. So, the nodes you showed in your network are typically very similar, and therefore I get, for example, when you look for connectivity or nobility, you you can compare them. When we look at uh, materials from an engineering point of view, and I think that the, that that will be the big difference is we go from, for example, from your nodes, yeah, then we process something, uh, the properties inside are changing, yeah, and then um, we continuously uh, uh, change the 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 information which is in, within the nodes. So if we have such a network, yeah, which is very heterogeneous in the information. What do you suppose can we do? Can we either have slices, so, so we only compare all the time with, with your methodology, each node, which is characteristic for a specific state, or is there a way of, of uh, you know, the connectivity in, in, within the history of the material and its, and its evolution? Yeah? Can we somehow also extract similar uh, characteristic uh, properties uh, out, of, out of such a network? Yeah, so this is a very interesting idea. Um, so as you rightly point out, the, the network I described was kind of binary in the sense that a node either exists or it doesn't, and a tie line either exists or it doesn't, right? Uh, but a much more interesting network, like you point out, would be something where the node itself has some you know, descriptive power. It's not just present or absent, and also the edges uh, the tie line should also, you know, uh, you know, there's information about the strength of the uh, of the interaction between two materials in that tie line, and so, you know, I can't tell you that we've done anything in that regard, but we're sort of very interested in thinking about problems like that, where we can define, you know, aspects of the node itself and aspects of the edge itself. Uh, one area that we're interested in that is in the in the area of metastable materials. So metastable materials by definition do not exist in what I talked about because they're not on the convex hull, so they're absent from the network. Um, but you might be very interested to sort of analyze properties of metastable materials, but it's sort of difficult the way I describe this network construction to imagine how do you construct the network mm -hmm. uh, when, the, when the node is not in the network. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that you know, things like distance from the convex hull would be a measure that we could apply to each node uh, if we could, if we could do this, so I, I think that that's a the the microstructural uh, analog is even more exciting possibility, maybe yeah. a more difficult possibility, but definitely something I think we should work towards. Yeah, I mean, within the NFDI network, we we promised that we make it this history of, within the material and its evolution, we make it available. Yeah, and uh, we sometimes get. Stuck uh, not only on, a, on the semantics, so how to describe it, but then what is the connectivity really? If I go, for example, from there's some thermodynamics going on, then then we have some kinetic uh, things going on, which are changing the material. The driving force is the thermodynamics still, but but how much happens then depends on so many different parameters. And then I add some deformation, yeah, and and that that can kind of context is interesting. Let's say for all of us uh, to work with this data when it comes out, because we, we will start producing that data and with that quality uh, to rather extract very fast, a lot of information out of, out of such complex networks. And I, I think that's fascinating, but yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm very excited about the prospect of problems like that, even if I don't completely know how to solve them yet, but I think that that's a, a worthy endeavor. So we switch to on site again, uh, Marcus. Can you go to the microphone that all the online people can uh, understand the question? I have a question related to this. So essentially, even if the nodes would, would be static, you're already in particular when you have n substantially larger than three, you're in fact talking about in fact higher order polytopes. Yeah, when you really think about, okay, you have a node and then how is the node connected to others? And in fact, they form polytopes. And can I also learn something from that? Oh, oh, right, yeah. right, right. Because interestingly, what I think, even if you have, even if you have a two-phase diagram, there's often much happening. But you showed, you showed the nickel aluminum phase diagram, where you have many metastable phases, or like this uh, narrow existence type of phases, like like strich phasen, what we were what you call in German. Um, but that 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 
doesn't this tell us that also basically not only how the node basically from a cardinality point is connected is relevant, but also basically which curvature you have from the inboard, uh, from the in and outgoing nodes. And then basically the question is, right. and that's my question, how realistic is it from an algorithmic point of view that you can then basically study um, the properties of these higher dimensional polytopes where even with polyhedra, we have quite some challenges when they become large and huge in, in terms of, of atom dynamics and atom networks, which when people apply these techniques already. Right, right, right. Yeah, but but again, uh, you know, I would say a super exciting area, right? So, you know, just to kind of emphasize your question, but not give an answer, which is that, you know, I, I talked a lot about the network as being nodes and edges, right? But as you as you well describe, there's other information in the in the convex hull, right? There's three phase equilibria, four phase equilibria, five phase equilibria, right? That I didn't talk at all about, but that information is is contained in the convex hull. So yeah, so so far we haven't extracted any of that information. The other the other piece of information that I think is what you were kind of getting at that's that's absent from my network, but definitely important is the shape of the convex hull, not just the topology of what's connected to what. But what is the shape? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I was thinking about maybe can we learn something from basically the subcontext to which we can disassemble? But if you think about the convex side, you just make it into subcontexts. Can basically then the subcontext get are they correlated? I can learn maybe something with respect to the dynamics of the Right. Right. Well, let, let me just give you one. Can you quickly uh, repeat the question? Uh, I'm not sure if I can repeat the question, <laughs> but, but sorry, I'm going to butcher your question. But basically, the idea is can we sort of understand uh, the, the polytopes, the shape of the polytopes that form in this convex hull construction and use this sort of decomposition of those polytopes uh, to, to provide new information. Uh, I'll just give you a very, very simple example of this. Uh, in the very, you know, the simple binary convex hull that I showed you, you know, for example, this, this compound here, you know, is deep in the convex hull. It means it's very, very stable relative to the two things on either side, right? There's this huge V in the convex hull there. Whereas say this compound is just at this very shallow part of the convex hull, right? So, you know, just barely stable compared to those two, right? So this information about the shape of the convex hull is just completely gone from my network, right? right? Those, those phases are connected in the network in, in very similar ways. Um, maybe I shouldn't say the information is gone, but it's sort of, implicit now. Um, but but yeah, definitely understanding things about the shape of these. And I just show this example in a binary system because it's easy to point to, right? In the higher dimensional polytopes, it's harder to sort of point to. But understanding that kind of shape dependent information, I think, is uh, is another interesting aspect. Yeah. I was, was also thinking in this direction, that I think it would be crucial to take this into account. Now, the information about how good things are connected, that means also how uh, the reactivity between different elements is, is given by this shape. Né? Whereas you, with the tie lines, you actually, that's also what you clearly indicated, you are uh, looking at the nobility. That, uh, in principle, what you are measuring is things which are not connected. Né? Right. But we want to know what is connected. And uh, I see here a bit of a challenge mm -hmm. or a difficulty. No? By, by just measuring what is not connected, you are also, uh, the risk is that this is uh, somehow modified or balanced uh, due to the fact what has been not investigated. No? So these things are also not connected. Right. Uh, and so you might get into wrong conclusions by focusing on nobility and not on uh, reactivity. No? Right. Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, one simple example of that is, like I say, this the, the database is evolving every day. Right. Right now, in the time that I you know spent giving this talk, I'm sure at least 30 compounds were added to the database. Right. So there's probably new stable compounds appearing on the convex hole all the time. And the other thing is that when a when a new compound appears on the database, it it can also knock other phases off of the convex hull. So it's not that just that the number of stable uh, materials is growing in time; it actually could decrease in time. Um, and so what this means in terms of the network is, yeah, the things that share a tie line last year 
may not share a tie line anymore in the future. Uh, right. So, you know, I mean, I don't know what to say about that, except that this is a sort of an ongoing uh, issue. Um, but it's a substantial one. I, I guess just to put this in perspective, you know, the network I told you about today had 21,000 stable materials. There's act, if you ask me what's the number of stable compounds in the OQMD today, it's actually 60,000. So it's not just a little bit bigger, it's a lot bigger. Uh -huh. And the problem is, to be honest, we don't have enough CPU time to compute the convex hull of everything again. Or well, we don't have the resources or the wherewithal, I guess. It, it's a relatively expensive endeavor to calculate this. So it's not like you could just calculate it every time you add a new compound to the database. Uh -huh. um, so that's another kind of issue that we we need to sort of figure out a more efficient way to compute to recompute this uh, when we add new compounds. Yeah. Are there further questions online? Not at the moment. There is one. Yes. Moritz, <laughs> please. Hi. Um, yeah, first of all, I want to say thank you for the nice, very nice presentation, interesting talk. Uh, and uh, more importantly, thank you very much for OQMD. Um, we as a developer of uh, CalFAT databases and software, so FactSage, um, we have used it already and um, we have made a product out, out of uh, OQMD also. Um, so that is taken up and is extremely valuable for us. Um, second question, I, I find the network um, idea interesting, um, but if you go to, or but maybe, rather question, what happens if you go to high temperatures when, for example, the um, aluminum nickel may not be considered as um, individual nodes, but they're connected, right? So then the analogy to the social networks doesn't hold anymore because um, there is now a continuous transition from uh, uh, Chris Wolverton and Tillman Hickel, right? Um, uh, you, you can have a solid solution between, um, I don't know, copper and nickel at uh, 800 degrees Celsius. Any idea how to use the network theory in such a case? Well, okay, so so first of all, I feel a little bit like if I said anything wrong about CalFAD, please feel free to correct, correct me. <laughs> um, but but secondly, I, I, I think from a CalFAD perspective, you know, just like you could imagine asking what the isothermal section is of any phase diagram, that isothermal section would tell you which phases share equilibrium with others. You could still define the network if you had the, you know, if you had the phase diagram at finite temperature. It's just that the phase, you know, what you call a phase now, like you say, is, is not going to be a static uh, stoichiometric point. It's going to be a solution phase or something like this. I, so in, in some ways, I think of defining the network would still work uh, at, at high temperature. I think what's really absent is the data. We don't have the data to compute that phase diagram at finite temperature, right? You know, if, if I, from, from CalFAD or from DFT, Right, so if I if I asked you to compute the 100 dimensional phase diagram from CalFAT, I don't think that there is a database to do that. And if I asked you to compute the Gibbs free energy of all 1 million compounds in the OQMD, there's not DFT yeah. data to do that. Mm -hmm. So I think this is a problem that we can work towards, but but right now we're sort of data limited. Mm -hmm. Okay, but but still, I don't don't see how you would. I mean, the 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 nodes are not nodes anymore, but they are there. There's this continuous transition. Does that? I mean, then 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 it becomes a phase diagram. Okay, now we we yeah. Well, I guess I mean, if you followed the if you followed the evolution of this, you know, high temperature phase diagram as a function of temperature. So imagine you're taking isothermal sections and you're lowering the temperature. You know, you when you when you have phase separation, like a miscibility gap mm -hmm. appears in a phase diagram, you would have a node split into two other yeah. nodes, right? But I think that's okay. okay. I mean, the, the node would split, but it would always split into two things that were connected. Uh, you know, the connection would be the miscibility gap. Okay. I don't know. Maybe I haven't really thought about this, but I, I think that would be okay if you had the data. But I, okay. I just don't know how we're going to get that at this point. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Another question here from the room or online. Well, it's already 12.30. Uh, I think we also should come to an end. I would have a lot of further questions, but uh, we think we have still a chance to discuss further. Um, 
So if there's no more question at the moment, then yeah, I would like to thank our speaker very much again. And, and thank also everybody who has joined here and online. Uh, for those who are here, uh, as I indicated at the beginning, we want to have a round table discussion a bit to speak about the different perspective of NFI consortia and uh, OQMD perhaps. Uh, to handle data, uh, that will be in the IRIS building uh, seminar room there, which was the room number three, uh, two, six, something, right? <laughs> but I guess you find it. Uh, so everybody who would like to join this discussion is most welcome to do so at uh, 1.30.